All right, you're very welcome along. Um, Ordinary Joe by Joe Schmidt is available now and published by Penguin Ireland. Joe's going to be in conversation with her own Joe Malloy in Dublin, Limerick and Belfast. Tickets for the events are available here at uh, penguin.co.uk forward slash events. And I'm delighted to say Joe Schmidt is with us. How are you doing? Yeah, not too bad, thanks to you. Really? Are yeah. you, is this the worst part of this? Yeah. Of you now? <laughs> I, it's just not something that I'd normally be doing. Um, I, I try to keep a, a relatively low prof profile out, outside of our match match week, so um, yeah, it's a little bit uh, uncomfortable at, at times. So why did you do it? Um, because uh, the whole project started off as a, as a bit of a, a project with my mum, sort of doing the, doing the early chapters, and then after doing the coaching for 25 years, I just felt like that there were a number of experiences and, and, and learnings that I'd had uh, and reflections that uh, I thought I'd, I'd put them down, and then I still wasn't quite sure that I'd I'd actually produced something with it, but but I had it and I'd done the work for it, and I thought, you know, I, I might as well put it together. Um, there's a, a John Wooden quote in the middle that um, struck me as being kind of central to the whole thing. Success is peace of mind, which is a direct result of self-satisfaction and knowing you did your best to become the best you're capable of becoming. Um, do you have peace of mind? Um, sometimes, yeah. I, I, you're you're always learning, and so you always feel like you can do things better. And, and you know, I, I guess that's a part of a, the human nature. Um, and you know, I, I, that connects. I think I mentioned that it connects with Maslow's self-actualization. That you actually want to try to become that that best version of yourself. And I, I think it's one of the things that I tried to challenge the players around as well, so that they can not just be the best player they are, but the best person, because um, yeah, I, I think when you've got a really good group of people, and uh, I do feel privileged to have played, uh, have spent time with a playing group that have been such a good group of people. That hierarchy of needs is something that Jim Gavin talks about as well, and I wonder if it's, if it's uh, almost a bit of a shield, because all sporting careers end in failure in some level, and that you, you play matches and the, the results dictate a lot of how you're going to feel about it, even though you're, you're trying to remove yeah. that. Constantly yeah. you're saying, there's a bit where you talk about, um, somebody asked you about the England game that you'd lost, and you're like, actually, that was our best performance. You know, they were, you must yeah. be frustrated with that. So that whole kind of notion of results not dictating how you feel, it also seems like it's impossible for you at the same time. Yeah, it, it is. I, I guess it's a paradox. You, you try to minimise that impact by, by prioritising the people and the performance and the process, not the result because the the result have there's so many variables in the result that you that you can't control um, that you can't always get the right result and sometimes some of the the variables are under your control and you didn't play well enough and and there's examples of us not having done that you you try to then learn from those and 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 learn from the wins as well as I, as I say in, in, in the book but those tend to scar a, l a little bit, and if you ask me about um, you know what I remember, I, I do remember a lot of the losses, <laughs> all of the losses probably, but but some of the good days I, I I've actually disciplined myself to remember, and um, I think I was asked if if I got if I had one piece of advice for Andy Andy Farrell taking over, I'd, I, I, my advice w would be just enjoy those really good days oh. because the, the, they. They come and go. How, how do you, how do the scars affect you? You mentioned the scars of losses because in my time knowing you, obviously you never coached me, you never had, yeah. I, had never, I, I, I never had the privilege of you coaching <laughs> me. And I often say this, that I probably wouldn't last five minutes <laughs> in your regime because of the detail and stuff. But you, you sound like, it seems like that you're a planner and you're a thinker and you're always looking ahead. So when you went into coaching first, had you any plan or structure to deal with losses or, you know, because a lot of people in sport are not successful or is it just, did you just go with the flow through enjoyment of, of coaching? Yeah, I, part of it was I, I was kind of bossed into it. I started teaching and, and, and the boss said, yeah, you, you're going to coach rugby. I, I volunteered to coach basketball and I went into it purely because, uh, you know, it was part of the school that you had to do it and then also, the more I got into it, and I actually enjoyed it, um, because it is a form of teaching in a lot of ways, um, the, the kind of, I got a real, um, you know, s sort of a buzz from, from seeing kids improve. And I started off coaching 13, 
you know, under 14, so 13 year olds, and and also the the enjoyment they got out of it. And you know, Did you I, give them a rollicking now if they didn't pull their socks and pull, uh, pull their weight properly, uh, even back then? Not not really, because you you were trying to be as competitive as you could, and you, you're talking about young hearts and minds. So it's then they, they haven't had the the experiences that that harden people against that or or prepare people for that so much. Um, yeah, we'd 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 still. I, I might give them a rollicking if they weren't respectful of the opposition, or they. You know, I, I talk about one time I was horrified where they did this um, grenade celebration where after scoring a try, Glenn Horton, he um, the players kind of assembled a little way away from him. He pretended to to pop the the pin out of the the ball grenade and lobbed it into this to the to the other players and they all fell about. Um, and, Sounds uh, great. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds great. Sounds cool. Well, they copied it off uh, Rugby League. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, I would be a bit of a traditionalist as far as the values of the game are concerned and, and, and showing respect. And uh, I did actually think there was going to be a mass brawl. The crowd was really thick. It was yeah, a derby. The didn't like it. No, no. Uh, well, one particular parent of the opposition <laughs> didn't like it. He came on the field and... And uh, thankfully, the referee diffused it. And, and uh, after the game, I was, I was, our captain was very apologetic um, uh, about having, you know, maybe got carried away. I think it was a bonus point try, and um, the boys were pretty excited about it. That was, that was. Uh, <clears throat> I wouldn't like to have been uh, one of those boys uh, facing. <laughs> you know, the perception is that the book title is ordinary, Joe. The perception is that. There's nice Joe and then there's <laughs> Joe, the the hard taskmaster. What what do you say to people who say that? Is that part of, for any successful person in sport or in business or whatever, there has to be an edge really for to to achieve, and you're top of the you're driving the bus effectively. So what would you say to people who say, well, there's this really pressurized environment that you like to create? Is that's in you maybe as a person and you like to drive yeah, people? Yeah, and I think. Achieve? Maybe players would, would focus on that a little bit, and I, I, I explain a couple of the a couple of the probably initial Monday morning review meetings where the Drico one is yeah, the famous one, the Drico one, and 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 uh, as well as that the the post Edinburgh game one, you know where I, I was pretty cutting, especially after I said um, you know where are you going to be in five seconds, and after three seconds I, I froze the video and I said wow you've been doing some great speed work. You haven't moved yet, and you're going to be over here in five seconds. So you only got two seconds to get there, knowing full well they weren't going to get there. But um, you know that, that, that is a, li a little bit harsh, and using sarcasm is probably not the the ideal thing for a coach. But that the, the ordinary bit is that um, that ordinary people too. Uh, we had a theme of ordinary men um, on the back of Christy Moore coming in and singing to the boys and. And uh, he sang Ordinary Man, and that became the theme for the week in the build-up to that last game of the Grand Slam in 2018 in Twickenham. And, um, and I guess I'm trying to say that um, ordinary people, uh, if, if, they, if they're working hard and they, they, and they care about people, but they, they care enough, enough about them that they're going to have a little bit of an edge at times, that that extraordinary things can be done and, um, and, and that's what the players managed to do in, in that week and at other times, you know, when we when we had really good days and thankfully we had a lot more good days than bad. It's just that, um, as Chu mentioned, it, it never finishes well and unfortunately it didn't because um, part of my frustration, Chu, is it always had finished well for me. Um, with Bayer Plenty, won the Shield and finished uh, right up there, and with the Blues, we got to that court, uh, semi-final, and that was that was a uh, the best we'd done in, in quite a long time. And and as well as that, the Claremont, we won the Bouclier de Brennus after a hundred years of them trying to do it. Um, so I, it, even Leinster finished pretty well. We kind of won three trophies that that year, even though we didn't get the the big European one. We we got the secondary one. So. It was pretty hard. So, do you have peace of mind now? This, like this, since the since the World Cup, has there have you been able to find that peace of mind? Not yet, but I, I think I, I will get it later on. And I'm over the next three or four months. I'm purposely 
trying not to think about what I might do next or um, because as I said on, on the late late day, I, I, I haven't earned enough to, to stay retired indefinitely. I'm gonna have I to go back to work. In 2011, Joe, when I retired, I said, right, I'm just gonna relax for the next few months and then I got a call from ITV and a newspaper, yeah. Sky, and so maybe you can come into the media. What do no, you reckon? <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, I'm, uh, you know, Penguin have, have done a great job of kind of putting me out there and um, and that that's part of the deal, you know, to, to try to get a, a bit of profile around the book to help them, but um, it's probably not the place that I've ever uh, felt comfortable. You're, you're you know, for. Um, TV analysis for the Six Nations, though? Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, like, because Roy Keane always swore he'd never do it, and then it turns out he's really good at it. Yeah, he is, yeah, and I, I've enjoyed watching some of what Roy has to say, but, you know, if you talk about edge, I'm not sure my edge is quite as far along the spectrum as Roy's. explaining what the opposition are doing, you know, where it, yeah. like I, I think th I, we're getting to a point now where the analysis is finally beginning to tell us stuff as opposed to when you started and it was all piss and vinegar and bluster. It, <laughs> it's definitely improved a lot as yep. your generation of players, that first generation, have, have come through and started to be able to explain exactly what's happening yeah, there, and why things are happening. There are definitely some good people involved and um, they, they don't need me, me involved on top of that. They, they've got good people. Well, that brings me to some of the really the best parts of the book that I really enjoyed the most was um, you talked about the coaching course that you were on when you were at Claremont and um, the research there that showed that ball retention, 60% of the responsibility for the ball retention lies with the ball carrier. Yeah. You know, you use the image of the mackerel in the boat. You need to be active yeah. and then the next two guys in are 20% and 20%. Um, and, you know, you tie that to the, the quote, uh, I think it's um, Graham Henry talking about the heartbeat of the game is yeah. the breakdown. And so this is, the, this is where we begin to see exactly what your philosophy is and where the, the bones of how you think about the game come from. Is that fair? Yeah, and that's what I, I try to be relatively candid, you know, people have said that I didn't, some people have said I didn't reveal myself in the, in the book, it, it, I revealed my, myself as a, as a coach, uh, I feel in the book, and a little bit of other things, and certainly, you know, there, uh, the time that I was walking up the steps for the Blues game, I, I couldn't get my diaphragm to lift, I felt so much pressure, I, I, I was taking really shallow, uh, rapid breaths because I felt so much pressure, um, just because of expectation, um, and, and and wanting something so much that you you have very little control once the ball's kicked off. And so, those those bits about the big rocks and and uh, and the you know the heartbeat of the game that. That's after a number of years of, of looking at the game, and, that was, and that was, you, you mentioned Graham Henry. Well, it's not a bad place to start if you if you're looking at guys like uh, guys like Ted and what they have achieved in the game. If you if if part of your philosophy kind of overlaps with with his, and also his career path, where there's a perceived brilliant start with Wales and then perceived failure, um, shocking failure in, in New Zealand terms in that World Cup where. The New Zealand Rugby Football Union decided to stick with them through yeah. that through that crazy yeah. review. Look, I, I presume you've read all the books around that review. The level of detail that they go into, uh, it could be scarifying to an entire culture to haul everything out into the light and have yeah. that. Do we need yeah. to do that? Something similar? You, you know what? There's so much of what Irish rugby does that's that's incredibly good, and we don't. It's not our national game like it is in New Zealand. I mean, in New Zealand, there's a that there's a transparent in expectation from the from the public. We've built an expectation, and I think that's fantastic because you want that expectation because that expectation suggests that you are doing something successful. Because once upon a time, an occasional win uh, against a big team was, was sufficient. Now there's an expectation we always beat a big team. You know, losing to an All Black team in a quarter final would have been accepted potentially 12 years ago, 10 years ago. Now. Losing to the All Blacks is is unacceptable, but not, I'm not sure when that shifted. But certainly talking to their staff afterwards, the fact they were massively up for the game was because we'd won two of the last three games against the All Blacks. We didn't often have the opportunity in the past to say that. So, you know, I, I think to haul everything out, I'm my biggest worry is that they go away from some of the stuff that's been incredibly good. The provinces they're performing really well in Europe. The, the, they always kind of dominate the Pro 14 playoffs. They might not win it, they, they might, Glasgow popped up you know, one time, Ospreys popped up one time, Scarlet's popped up one time, but in the 10 years I've been here, the rest of the time, it's been dominated by the Irish teams. And so 
there's a lot of things that have been done well. And on the back of a poor performance against the All Blacks, uh, a, a poor performance against, certainly in the, in the last 60 minutes, the last 40 minutes particularly against Japan, that we suddenly say, well, oh, we, we have to completely reconstruct what we're doing. I, I think those knee-jerk reactions sometimes are, are, are a real, um, a real risk. And, and that's what New Zealand didn't do in the end, did they? They actually stuck with Graham Henry. They, uh, Which was brave at, at the time, considering there must have been a lot of pressure to get rid of him because that team had failed. Yeah, you, you say they failed. Their actual win-loss record was really was Look, really positive. Yeah, a and it's the, a word, isn't it? Fail, the, fail, or failure. The, the way they prepared, it's funny because the guy who ran that preparation texted me straight after our game against the All Blacks, and he was an integral part of the the players going out of the first six rounds of the Super Rugby competition so that they could get into the best physical, physical condition they could be in. Then they came in, and a number of our guys who came back in didn't actually play well, and then um, lost a bit of confidence and lost a bit of continuity, and they went into the World Cup in the end a little bit underdone um, match-wise. So that, that didn't work, but it was something that they, they trialled that they thought might work. And, yeah. and I, I would say, you know, the thing that, I would definitely steer away from next time in the lead up to a World Cup um, is trying to focus on a World Cup a year out. I, I, I think there's, a, there's too much emphasis on the World Cup already. Our, our bread and butter is all based around the Six Nations and I, I love the Six Nations. Uh, I think after it's the heights of 2018, Team of the Year, Coach of the Year, World Co Team of the Year, World Coach of the Year, World Player of the Year. Looking back on it, Joe, is there anything you would have done differently, aside from the mental part of maybe looking, looking ahead to maybe looking past the Six Nations and looking too far forward? Because I do agree with you, you know, we're probably best to stay in the, in the process of, of one game at a time. I always found that as a player, if you take your eye off the ball a little yeah. bit, it can. Yeah. It can affect, it can skew lots of things. Is there anything you would have done differently yeah. from a tactical point of view? Or a, I, a, a management point of view, because they seem to lose their mojo, and you kind of said it after the Welsh game that you were broken a bit in the Six Nations. Is there anything you yeah. would have done differently looking back? I know that's a very, it's a big question, but that's probably the question people want to know: is, you know, did we reach the Everest, and then did we kind of tail down a bit, which can happen? Yeah. See, I, I think what people don't understand is how fine the margins are. You know, you don't have to be far off. For another big team to knock you off, you know, and and uh, you know, you mentioned that Welsh game. You know, it ended up one try apiece. They scored early within two minutes, and then um, on the back of a number of penalties, they they built uh, a margin in very very wet conditions. And then you're trying to chase a game; it, it's very hard to do. Uh, you saw the All Blacks lose heavily to the Wallabies. Um, and turn it round the following week. I, I know they did get a red card, but almost. Even before that, they were actually struggling a little bit yeah. performance-wise. Because we all thought Ireland were back, back in the groove with the Scottish game. Yeah, you know what I mean, yeah. Well, I, I was, I was hopeful of the same. But one of the things about the groove, have a look at the playoffs. You know, how good were the All Blacks against us? And sure, we, we pl didn't play well, and some of it was off turnovers where we'd actually created opportunity, and then they got the points on the back of it. But then, as good as they were against us, and as up for the game. The following week, how good were England? Then the following week, South Africa stepped up. And you know, I don't think too many people were picking England to lose that final. Because week to week, to get that emotional intensity up, to get that mental focus right, you're dealing with a massive human factor there. And, and it's, it's hard to, it's, you know, I, I've often been criticized as, as someone who wants to micromanage everything and, and control everything. It, it's, it, it's almost uh, the opposite if you're in our environment. You'll see how much uh, of the responsibility is shared, particularly with even the, the, um, the senior leaders in the team. But I think part of it is that there are so many things you don't control that you want to have a, a degree of control over things. We, we, all, we all, it's a human thing to try to control the elements of our life that we can control because we know that there are all sorts of variables that we can't. So if you don't control the things that 
that are at least influenced by you, then you know you already know there's a whole lot of things that aren't. Yeah, but you know, decisions or or weather or um, you know a, a little bit of luck, the way the ball bounces on the day. And being being in that position as a head coach, you have a natural leadership. Um, volume in yourself as well to to want to control you've got to take some sort of control but because you're responsible for yeah, it for so sure if you don't take well, your head is on the block and exactly and, and that's yeah. that's part of the success and I, I don't use the word failure and the reason i don't use it is because i've been there as a player and i know that you can put in so much time and effort and it sometimes it just goes wrong and it went wrong this year and i personally think Aside from any tactical stuff, or, uh, which I'm, I'm, I'm don't have a strong opinion on, too many of your players just didn't find their their consistency throughout the year. If, if why do you think that happened, though? Well, I, you know, it, with success, you're in sport, and when you win, the hardest thing to do is is when you get up there is stay there for any team and any level. And I think maybe it's a two percent thing, and you can still train well, you can still do all the things, and and hindsight's a wonderful thing in sport yeah. because. So, well, and that's I guess that's what the whole point of these conversations are is to try and find the hindsight to use that to propel what happens next. So take us back to before the England game in the Six Nations. Then now, if you could tap yourself on the shoulder the week before that, what would you be saying to yourself? Yes, yeah, he. Uh, that week we we focused on the England game. It was the it was the camp before that, and even the twenty four hours of Christmas. Yeah, yeah, and and even before that, we certainly it was already it was already on our radar. And so we, um, you know, if if you think back, and people talk about the the, the unbelievable two eighteen, we weren't overly good in Chicago against Italy, we weren't overly good against Argentina, and we got up for one emotional high against the All Blacks, and, and I, I felt we played really well that day. Um, and, and we deserved to, to win. So we didn't actually have to do too much in that end, but and prior to that, we'd already started talking about the World Cup. And so then the December camp, so the, the actual England week itself, but we in the camp week before that, we were already kind of um, just focused on us and trying to be better ourselves and doing a lot of recovery. Having because, that conversation with the team as well? like uh, uh, With the... W- yeah, with the leadership group, um, you know, we took the leaders out uh, of that Italian game in Chicago and we spent, um, with uh, eight guys, we spent three days with some external people coming in and talking about leadership and how you best lead and tr- we were trying to grow our people because while we were trying to build depth, we were actually trying to build leadership at the same time. That's what we were attempting to do. And so that all seems like the right thing to do, though. Yeah, you, you, and that's the problem too. You know, you you, you kind of think about it now, and uh, you trying to build the top end and and deepen the, the the base, and that was all, that and it was all going quite well. You know, up until the the that England game, I felt it was going quite well, and then we didn't play well. Uh, didn't play great against Scotland at all. Johnny went off after 20 minutes, and Joey hadn't had a lot of time either. And then, uh, is the England game in retrospect where it starts to go wrong? Is, is there is there collateral damage from that that we don't? Not, not really. The England game, with less than a quarter of the game left, we're down 17-13 against against the team that you saw how they played in the semi-final, and they had everyone there. They had, you know, when they lost later in the in the Six Nations, there was no Atoje, there was no uh, Marco Vinopola. You know, suddenly it's not quite the same team. It, it doesn't take too much, and we're very conscious of that ourselves. At the last World Cup, you take take out Paul O'Connell, Jared Payne, Johnny Sexton, Pete Omani, um, Sean O'Brien. Yeah, you know, Sean O'Brien. Is that the same team um, that you put out if you haven't got those guys? Now the guys who came in that I felt did a good job on the day. But how many players did you cap since the last World Cup? Um, I think it. it It'd have to be more than 70, yeah, 70 or 80, yeah. Uh, again, that all seems like exactly the right thing to do. Can we go back to the bit where we're, we're in the World Cup cycle? Because we, as a rugby culture, are a bit trapped in that and yeah. we're bound to be. Like, yeah. your World Cup diary starts for the World Cup in 2019 with the preparations for Japan 2019 started with individual player reviews a few weeks after our exit from the 2015 Rugby World Cup. Yeah. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like. And it seems like we've all got to this point where um, this is our white whale, and the white whale ends up killing Captain Ahab. Yeah, I think I think the white whale was the All Blacks, though, and and we died many deaths 
But once we once we got the white whale, we got the white whale again. And I do think that you know those glass ceilings. That the more you focus on the glass ceiling, I think you add layers to it, and then it's harder to break. I, I, I think you make it bigger than than it really necessarily has to be. And I guess what I'm trying to say is, let's not make it so big. Let's not focus so much on it that it starts to actually um, inhibit be, become something that it's not. And that seems to have happened here. I, I feel a little bit like that, um, and I feel that I didn't help because I. I helped make it something really, really big for us. And was that internally with the players and the coaching? Yeah, group? and and even internally myself, you know, it was it was something huge for for, for me. And um, and inevitably, you know, I mentioned Daniel Goldman in the book. It, it, your anxiety, your thoughts, your attitude, it, it does ripple through an environment if you're at the top of the environment. So I, I do think that um, I could have managed that better. How? And, uh, well, How, what I, would you do now? I, I, I would not talk about it uh, that far in advance. I would. St I was always thinking about things in advance anyway. I was always planning in advance. I didn't have to actually, you know, uh, talk about it with the players. And, and we actually intentionally talk, uh, talked about periodization, about tapering, about recovery and, and peaking. You know, we'd, we'd never talked in those terms before. It was all about, okay, do your recovery for sure, but then let's let's make sure we get the upswing at the end of the week, not the not the end of the next year. I mean, th that's a long way in in the future, and so yeah, that that would be a a regret that I have. But you know, you talk about hindsight. That's that's you know, if, if we'd if we'd won that game against the All Blacks, uh, would I feel the same way? I, I probably wouldn't, and that's that's always the danger. That's why I say, you know, you look at a review. And you say, right, let's let's make sure we learn from this. I, I think we can learn things for sure. I think Andy and the team will learn things, and the players will learn things. But it, it's I, I think there's so many good things that have happened over the last the last ten years that my biggest fear is that we we suddenly say, okay, we need to do things differently. Uh, there are things that we definitely. Need to need to fine tune, but I think if we if we throw the throw the whole thing out, uh, I, I'd be absolutely um, disappointed with that because I, 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 maybe it's not the best way forward. What happened in the Japan game? I think the Japan game. There's been games where I, I, I've been on the other side where a team have scored early and kind of there's an expectation that that's what they should be doing and that more tr more scores will come and when we went up 12-3 um, you know I think there was an expectation of our players oh well we've just got to you know we've just got to keep ticking over here yeah. um, and immediately after the kickoff James Ryan takes an exceptional uh, take of the kickoff almost leaning horizontally back we get the ball Cross kick to Keith Eels. Keith Eels gets in a good space, gives an inside pass to Rob Carney. Rob Carney, we're back over on the attack. We um, we go through a few phases. We get called for a knock on, which is tough because that momentum then stops when we've got them under pressure. But um, you know, it, <laughs> Bestie gives the ball back to Tyke Furlong, it, albeit it bounces up. And um, you know, from that scrum, I think we just allow ourselves to taper a bit and the margins are fairly fine and I think what you saw from Japan is that in front of their home crowd um, with any sort of latitude they got given they they made the most of it and Scotland knew they had to win it was a one shot and Scotland are a good team and they couldn't topple them and it was I think in 9-6 at half time against South Africa yeah it was very tight and South Africa went on and won the whole thing. I think it was 5-3. Do you, do you think it was 5-3? Yeah. Because yeah. I did the comms for the, the Japan game, and I felt comfortable as well at 12-3, because, you know, yeah. you probably admit the team didn't have to overextend themselves. No. They were doing some good stuff, 12-3 up. That scrum was a massive turning point. Yeah. Do you think if, if he'd beaten Japan and lost the quarterfinal, the reaction would be a bit different? Did that add to the negativity and maybe would we have a better crack off, off 
Mm. Either way, yeah, we yeah. said this in the show many times, either way we were going to South Africa or Japan if we come out of the group, it's going to be incredibly difficult yeah, anyway. Yeah. And I mean, South Africa ended up winning the whole thing. And if you look at their game against the All Blacks, when we watched that and analysed it, the All Blacks scored two tries in four minutes. Apart from that, I think South they were Africa very had, dominant South in the Africa early parts. actually, yeah, the first twenty minutes, uh, they fifteen nearly minutes, blew them so, away. yeah, and and it wasn't just when they had the ball. It was the All Blacks tried to play and get to edges and and even try to play through them, but they got absolutely beaten backwards. So. You know, there's no guarantee uh, because of the way South Africa to play that, you, that, that they would have been in, any easier than the All Blacks. We, we always knew that, um, that that quarterfinal was going to be a massive challenge e either way. And in and, and the draw, um, you know, and again, not, not too many people focused on it, but we got to Fukuoka and that weekend off was massive for us and we went out and played I felt we played well against Samoa and I know they were a bit bedraggled at that stage but that weekend off was massive you had the All Blacks have a weekend off right before playing us you had England with a weekend off and Eddie was pretty public about saying but that's brilliant that's great preparation for us we're off for a, a tough day's work and then a few beers and we'll come back in and we'll we'll be ready to rock and you know and the French I don't think they were too upset about not getting the chance to top the pool. Um, you know, there, there were rumours they were going to play a B team because they were already qualified and, yeah. and then freshen everyone up. To, and let's face it, I think they're 19-10 up, 30 minutes to go, the four or five metres driving toward the Welsh line when Vahamahina um, elbows Wainwright. You'd have to say that at that stage, they are totally in control of that game. They, they actually missed a few chances in the first half. On the, on the basis of how that game was being played at the time, that those three teams all looked to be in, in, in great uh, frame of mind, great physical condition. And it, it, I think it was a bit of an advantage that, that, that again, that's what I'm talking about, uncontrollables. We, we can't control that. You just got to get on. And, and I felt we could still be really competitive and, and unfortunately we weren't. Are you going back and second guessing your team selections at any point? Could Sexton have played against Japan, for example, or was he not fit? Yeah, see the problem was that we, we felt that he, he may then injure himself. Um, it, it was tenuous. Right. And, uh, you know, if, if we played him against Japan and he'd, he'd done damage, and he hadn't been able to play against Russia and Samoa, or potentially, you know, if he was out for three weeks, yeah. um, then that's why I say, uh, you know, in hindsight, would you do it differently? I'm, I'm not sure that I'd do that differently. Um, Jack Carty had impressed us, and he started the game the first 20 yeah, minutes. Uh, I, I thought he, he was really good. Yeah. Um, and the way we wanted to play that game, actually suited the way Jack played. And uh, the, the fact that, you know, the two tries came from the, from, from the kicks, the short kicking game uh, for the second try, the, the wide kicking game for the end in the line break immediately after, you know, it looked like it, it, it looked like the decision was vindicated at that stage. And, and could we have predicted that the, the way that things would turn? I, I don't think you could blame all that on Jack because, uh, we got hesitant def defensively. It was more uh, the leadership issue, I, I kind of feel, as opposed yeah. to the skill sets. Yeah, just... yeah, yeah. That that that, that might be right. Um, I, I think with with Jack, he is he is a bit quieter. He hadn't had, you know, Johnny is He's inexperienced. Is a very well. yeah. Is a very um, is a very important cog for us in that leadership. Uh, and, and in that position, it's hard to get away from a leadership responsibility because you're calling the shots and you're the conduit for a lot of the play that, that, uh, that we try to create. One of the other criticisms that has been levelled is that you were very loyal to the players who got you there. And it's understandable enough that, you know, this is the group of players who got us to being the best team in the world. We beat the All Blacks twice. Do you feel that now? Do you agree with that? Is that unfair? Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure that you know, because one of the, one of the players that that had got us there, we didn't take, and 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 became a big story. And for me, it was it's probably one of the hardest discussions I've had. So I, I, I'm not sure that that the criticism is is completely valid. But um, there were some guys there, you know, that 
we felt the All Blacks were going to do some things early in the game and they did exactly what we expected. What they do with the first ball they got, they hooked it in the air as high as they could, straight into our 22, because they wanted to make it an aerial contest to start with, because they, without getting into double jeopardy, they felt we would try to come hard off the line at them. They didn't want to get knocked behind the line like they did with South Africa early in the game, so put it in behind us so they can go after us. So we felt that we would best solve that by having experience at the back, and, and um, you know, I, I, I think, you have a rationale for doing things, and then you have hindsight again yeah. that that can always question the rationale. And I, I think one of the things that, that frustrates me personally is that I have that same hindsight and I second guess myself. I say in, in the book, whether we win, lose or draw, I question what we do. I look back and I say, maybe this or maybe we could have done that, but... The rationale gives you peace of mind though, because my, you know, if I was going back without the... Um, hindsight, I'd make the same decision because the decision was based on logic and it wasn't based just on loyalty to these players. No, no, there was, there, I felt there was logic in it. And the other thing is that, uh, you know, you've never been in a selection meeting. The selection meetings, as I said about, uh, you know, the perception of wanting to control and micromit, I'd love to bring some of these people into our environment and allow them to sit there now. I wouldn't because well, what that's we an do unfair is, perception. Then, if you're well, saying that that is the case, well, that I, Joe, I, Joe is not this control freak that yeah. people <laughs> sometimes make. Is that like because that's sometimes whether it's right or wrong, that's the perception that Joe controls everything. But you're saying that from the other selectors, if they spoke uh, and they yeah, say something uh, totally different, yeah. I mean that respectfully. And, and that's now, why. That. That's why you know selection meetings will sometimes be two, two and a half hours, and. I don't know much as much about certain positions as some of the other people in there. You know, if you've got really good people, and I had super people. I, Give I, us an know, example of a forward know, selection. Well, then, is there? I, I don't know. I don't know what um, you know. Uh, a lucid prop. I don't. I don't know the ins and outs of of the scrummaging that they have to do and the lineout responsibility they have. You know, I, so I. I I, I'm I'm going to be part of the discussion for sure, but but you trust Greg Feeks? Oh, huge call on I, that. I, I worked with Feeky for ten so years. So the props so now know that Greg, Greg actually dropped him, not Joe. And and that is far from the truth because I, you know, and and whether it gives an impression that you're a control freak or not, um, I know that it's my responsibility. And when we come out of any selection meeting, we are all in agreement. And so everyone contributes, but then I know my head is on the block as you described, therefore I stand over any of the selections we make. And that's, that's your that's job a as a head coach. responsibility of the head yeah, coach. Yeah. Well, it, it is. Yeah, if, I if you ever abdicate that, I, I think it's... But that brings pressure as well, doesn't it? Because you have to take the accountability. Um, I often said it about head coaches that some assistant coaches that I would have worked with in Munster and Ireland over the years became head coaches and their personality and the pressure kind of gets to them. Yeah. And it can do, and it's a hard thing to manage because you have yeah. a lot of, you have to take everything on board, don't you? And, and I, I think I say in there, that, you know, there can be real distractions. Um, and you, you know, you have people questioning, I mentioned in there, you're questioning the decisions you make, but even then, some of them even questioned your personality or your character, and it can be quite personal. And so, you know, it's really important. I, th I think one of the one of the things for for coaches is is to have people that they trust, that that give them genuine feedback. And if it's criticism, it's criticism. You know, there's there's people that I would turn to to chat to that, um, you know, if they said, look, to be honest. Um, you know, why did you do that, or why did you pick him, or, you know, and, and I would think back and, but there are sometimes you see people who are outside the environment who've kind of never played the game at a, at, at a high level and, and... Can I ask why you care about them so much? Why because you... because they, they influence the players. Do they, they though? Uh, yeah, they do, because things, why, why things leak in. Because, I... because, because they have a platform, Jew. You know, because, because they have that platform, because it's so visible, other people absorb it, and inevitably, it's like the team leaking out. Once you name the team, you know it's probably gonna get out. Because they're, especially 
imagine you are picked for the first time, Joe Gilroy, to play, I'm not sure which position. <laughs> <laughs> I think you know, well, go yeah. on. Um, you're going to tell your mum and dad, yeah. you're going to tell your siblings, you, even your best mate, and it, it does tend to leak out like that. It's, it drifts in like that as well, where, you know, uh, it's, someone will say, oh, you know, there's doubt about this and people are questioning this. And, and uh, you know, uh, to the extent that, you know, when, uh, when, when players are just, they're just trying to get their confidence and things like that, it, it, it can be quite tough, you know. And, and I, I know people feel that, ah, oh, you know, they're, play, they're, they're at the top of the, that's still very human. They're, look, they're ultimately very fragile. I, it felt sometimes like they cared a little bit too much about that stuff. Now, I bumped into a couple of them in Japan on the Sunday night after the game, and they were upset with the media, and they were talking about it. And I, uh, I felt like, yeah. I felt even Johnny, Johnny addressed it on the Friday in the no, press conference before the last game. He was like, look, I'm sitting here. If we lose this game, a lot of you are going to be saying I'm washed up. And I'm like, just you all need to stop thinking about that. I felt it was like... But, but I get it, Gerald, in a sense that, because I was on both sides of the fence. I'm now um, the dreaded media, if you like. But being the player, and it does, it does get in. No matter how much you block it out, the one thing that would irritate me, and I can empathise with you, is if there's inaccuracies. I never had a problem with if someone had a cut off you for playing yeah, crap. Yeah. But sometimes it's the inaccuracies, and it's probably the experience of blocking it out comes with experience, doesn't it? Yeah, and the younger and player. I there are some of our players who, 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 you know would get upset with a, a sense of injustice if somebody has focused on one thing they did in the game and they felt they did a lot of other things well and you know and they and they got labeled with with you know that their whole game was centered around you know I, I thought JJ played I was played, say, played no, great I mean, in the weekend example, played really well misses and, a drop goal yeah. and, and then he misses a drop goal at the end and suddenly it, He's you know, the, the, the whole thing is colored by that and a player you know, who's played really well, and I think he played really well. And he kicked the conversion from the sideline to, to put them the level anyway. Yeah. But then I look at some of the things that get said, and I can understand his frustration. I, I, I think it's it's easy for you to say, why did they let it? Because they're human. Well, because they feel that it's an unjust. So it's not that easy. You, you should check our YouTube comments sometime. They're they're not very good. They, a lot of people don't like what we do. So we, we we're exposed to it every day, and you just have yeah. to develop a thick skin. Because there was a, a bit where Sloney tells you, great advice to give me: yeah. don't read the papers <laughs> yeah. and don't listen to the radio. And yet, like you find yourself listening to the radio. Well, and one one of the things that is difficult for, for for me, the players don't always have to do media, but but I do. So. Uh, what is being said is going to be the the starting point of a media interview. So if I'm not aware of what's being said, then the I, question I, I, might blindside you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And there's a there's a risk in that. Now, since since the World Cup final, I I haven't had to or the quarter final. Um, I haven't really since the World Cup final. Since I've been in the public eye, because I, I certainly wasn't for two weeks because I was keeping my head down, but. Um, I, I'm not nearly as across what's been said as I would have been if I'd been going into a, a media conference at the December camp or before the Six Nations and being asked about these things because I'd be across what the themes were Mourinho, so that I could would respond. You, would you take any criticisms as a positive? I know there's, there's a fine line between someone saying stuff out of context and someone actually saying stuff that's true. Would you actually ever go... You know, there's some yeah, truth to uh, maybe us not playing well on a especially, Saturday. Especially some people, you know, who, who you think, yeah, he's dead right. You know, I, I, can't, I can't hide from the fact that he, he, he's dead right. We, we didn't do this well enough and, um, and we've got to take that on the chin. And I, I think, I even think all around, coaches... Even around are like your that. own performance, because, you know, I had that before when I, I yep. criticised Munster and, you know, you're in a place where you're... Yeah, uh, what, where, why I've gone here, but sometimes see, I think you are emotionally attached, though. Yeah, and I think, but so, sometimes, yeah. some with you being emotionally attached, then does that affect yeah. your judgment? Oh, sometimes, I think it does. I think it does because I am emotionally attached, because you can't put so much into something, and I, I know people, people have perceptions around me, and I, I say that I, I don't, 
I don't take a day off because there's always something pops into your head or, or you're consciously working, but even unconsciously you think about, geez, maybe we could try this or maybe we could do, and it, you know, that sort of thing. If you put that much effort into something, then... You're gonna fight for it. Of course you are. And yeah. But people, people, on that one, I just wanna say this one, Jerry, I'll let you t uh, ask Joel then. You know the day off thing that you said? You know what yeah. the perception there is and, and, and that that's way too much that Joe never took. I understand what you mean. Yeah. You're not working 20, 12 hours a day, every day, seven days a week. No, it just means no. that you're on, your mind is switched on. Because I had it as a player, you might have Thursday or Friday off, but you're not off. You're off from a rest in the body, yeah, but yeah. mentally you could be on the video, you could be yeah. doing stuff. I, I would have encouraged players to take um, a block off, like a, like a whole day, or you know, get their work done early in the week, take a whole day. Just, just to and, and encourage them. You know, there's there's one time in there where Paul said to me, you know, text the players and say, do something. Yeah. Don't, don't don't think about it. You know, and I even consciously tried to do it myself. And and I, I remember I watched the movie with my two youngest kids that day because I, I. I felt I needed to freshen up, you know. It's very and difficult, though, isn't it, to separate and get get out of yeah, it when you're it, in it, that. It is that because you, because you're so embedded in it. Um, there was one last thing on that because when you say you respect the if the viewpoint is coming from somebody you respect, obviously we work a lot with Brian and um, himself and Isa both talked about the failure at the World Cup. What did you make of what Isa had said? Yeah, it's funny because I I, I haven't seen the podcast and I haven't. I haven't read what he said, but um, you heard about he, it. He, he, he texted me and said, uh, "Hey, Joe, the way I phrase things, uh, it didn't quite come out as I as I meant it to." Um, and uh, you know, I, I I could show you the text. You know, a lot of it was very very positive. Um, you know, about the what I'd done in Leinster and and and, and how he felt I'd influenced Irish rugby. And so um, I'm not sure what he did say, but or, or what Dricko said. It's like it's like Dricko. I have, I have some of the stuff that he said yep. there, just just for clarity, in, in case uh, I don't want you to think that we hadn't given you the chance to see it. Joe started to go away from his tried and trusted drills and introduced a bit of what we call unstructured play that came into Ireland camp and training. And in the Six Nations, they were throwing offloads. There was continuity to their play. That got them all the way to the top of the world and an unbeaten year with all the trophies. Is that your post-event narrative that you talk about coming in where team plays well and wins games and everybody... Yeah, yeah, it's interesting because in Leinster, in Ireland, we would have all, we would have always done unstructured play. You know, we had, uh, we had a drill that we would do, you know, in every open session, you know, with, with three sausage bags and, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd intentionally try to unstructure it and I'd, we'd kick balls in behind them, we'd do all sorts of unstructured play. So, um... Yeah, you know, I, I guess sometimes Issa's looking for, because um, we all do it. I'm not sure I've got it right. Maybe it is the right thing to, to plan something a year out. I just, in retrospect, I don't think that's the right thing. Maybe plan it, but don't tell everybody you're planning it. Well, yeah, I think that's probably valid too, Jure. But, um, you know, I, I'd, I'd be pretty close with Issa. Um, and, Clearly, and, like yeah, for years. Going and, back and, a and, for, and, and for years. And, and even during the World Cup, you know, text conversations were happening. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not sure that uh, because e even players who are there, they they start they start trying to to find reasons. But when you're forcing yourself to find reasons, you you might come up with something that's that's not actually much of a contri contributor to, to to the outcome, because we we look for this cause effect relationship. But when there are so many variables, it's very difficult to say, oh, that's a cause effect, you know, and... Um, because sport is made yeah. up of a million different things. Um, in the last 48 hours, you've been linked um, with uh, Ian Foster's management team in New Zealand. And don't really? have you seen this? Have you not seen no, this? Oh, yeah, sure. no, no, so you and Greg no. Feek and... Um, uh, the forwards coach who you had for a year, John... John Plum Plumtree. Plumtree, yeah. yeah. Apparently the three of you are all going to be part of his, um, his backroom team. <laughs> You're going to be number two, so it's like obviously clearly, clearly a sign exactly he's what they did. He's put you in as, as one of his <laughs> part of his team. Maybe he's the yeah, agent. You know, I, look, uh, Fozzie knows and I know that I'm not part of that team um, and I've had discussions with him for, for, for a long time, but well before the World Cup. But, um, you know, I, I, I think... Um, 
I, I, I'm not sure I'll, I'll ever go back into coaching. I, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. And, and what I'm intentionally trying to do at the moment is, is just not even think about it for four or five months. And we're not going to do anything until Luke finishes his, his school year. Um, so that's you know, end of May, early June. And then we'll definitely try to spend a bit of the summer here um, before we, we decide where we go next and whether that's staying here or whether it's, it's going to France or whether it's going back to New Zealand. Because I know that there's sure. lots of business people who you've got connections with who I have no doubt you could work with in, in a multi a, a range of different ways. But it does seem to me that you've built up a lot of rugby IP, that you've reached a situation in your career now where you've had a, a big setback compared to the level of success you've had everywhere else. And that's the bit where the great coaches learn so much about themselves, even the self-analysis you're already doing. Yeah. So Belichick failed at the Cleveland Browns before he became the greatest sports coach in any sport of all time. Like, Greg yeah. Henry failed, I know you don't use that word, but like, then went on to release the burden on somebody. It would be a shame to waste all the, the stuff, especially the self-reflection. Yeah, and, and part of it, I remember getting off the plane and uh, we'd had to get up at 3.30 to get to the airport and um, the, you know, the plane journey, there's a bit of angst about, I knew I had to meet the media at the, at the airport and, um, you're at a bit of a low ebb, plus you're really tired. And, and um, I remember saying there that um, I, I was kind of motivated to go back into coaching because I wanted to, I, I didn't want it to end like that. And there's still a, because it's still raw, because the, the scab hasn't formed over the, over the wound, I still feel a little bit like that. And that's why I'm trying to skip myself the distance and say four or five months time, if I still feel like that, then maybe I'll go back into rugby coaching because I, I agree with you. I, I've, I've learned, I've learned through the last twenty-five years, but I, I've, I've learned a lot in the what last two months. What would make you not go back into coaching? Just, I, I guess, I can't help but go, go in fully. You know, that, uh, <laughs> I got offered one job, um, and uh, you know, they said to me, "Oh, look," uh, I, I said, "No, nah, look, I, I'm." Uh, I'm not ready to go back into full time. Uh, they said, look, what about we just set the job up and it's only three days a week. And I just looked at the guy and the guy knows me and uh, it's a job, uh, not here, but I said to him, I can't do three days a week. If something needs to get done, if yeah. I think I can find a margin here or whatever, uh, I'm gonna commit fully. So I can't agree to a three day work, uh, work week in coaching because it's too hard not to think, wow, yeah, I can go and see would this guy. Would you not dip in and out as a consultant if if, if a certain uh, team would want you for yeah, a certain yeah, period of look, time? Which, um, so, I, like some, Graham Henry came to Leinster for a little bit of time and some yeah, things that, like that. that. That sort of thing maybe, um, because I, the only thing is I, I love the actual coaching on the pitch. When you're a consultant, you're watching someone coach and giving them feedback. The bit that I love about the job is, is, is kind of working out a strategy trying to help a player to get better. And that's one of the frustrations of doing a national team is, is that, you know, if, if Jura is playing a, a, at 10 for us and he whips in for, for six weeks and then he's gone again and then he whips in for a, 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 a southern, southern Hemisphere tour for two or three weeks, you know, I don't actually work in a progression with that player. I, I, I just help them get organised in, in a very short window and it's, it's not... It's not uh, individual coaching, it's, it's just coordinating a Did team. Did that really. change the way you coached Leinster then to Ireland? Not, not really, because part of the continuity, and I know I copped criticism initially for having uh, a lot of Leinster players in the Irish team, but it's, it, it, part of that continuity was that, that we did the same things. You know, we, There was very little difference from what Leinster were doing to what Ireland were doing. Um, it, because we had this, the big rocks were exactly the same rocks, you know, and and it's just that sometimes I think let's take Scotland for an example in the World Cup against us, they were stifled. They didn't have the chance to play. They actually, and I say in the book that the the possession territory was pretty fifty fifty. In fact, they had more of it because in the second half they attacked a fair bit, but they didn't they didn't get any score. Um, then the next two games against. Uh, Samoa and Russia, gee, they looked a million dollars. There was offloads, there was, yeah. you know, and then they suddenly came up against Japan and they scored that early try and then there was probably, you know, a 30 minute period where they were really struggling to get anything together because 
The problem with going from uh, a, a provincial team or a club team into the test arena is that everything has less time and space about it. And, and you know, I think you may have a willingness to play a certain way. And we also, two of the guys who offloaded the most for, for Leinster uh, were, were Dricko and Sean O'Brien. They were, they were two of the guys who offloaded the most. Well, Dricko then retired a year afterwards. Um, the, the, the 2014 was his last. And then Shawnee, he, he had a very uh, disrupted kind of time disrupted period. With the injuries. Uh, and so as much as we tried to get him in, and he could create play. Now, a lot of it was because it, it, Dricko was not a big man, but he had the ability to control the, the collision. He had that late footwork and, and super silky sh skills, you know, inside out, you know, um, and, and Shawnee had a bit of both, not quite the, the, the real footwork, but it was pretty good. But he was this tank, um, and so he still freed the ball up. And so sometimes the, the sort of player um, helps it happen as well. Because as soon as you get a player who's not really used to doing it or he, he's not overly good at it, as soon as he thinks about doing that before he's won the collision, I think then you lose a collision you saw New Zealand versus England. They split them open a few times, and I thought, wow, you know. Have you ever told a player not to offload in a match? Uh, we were in Paris uh, playing uh, Russing one day um, when they were Russing Metro, and it was there was doubt whether the game would go ahead. The, the, the pitch was frozen earlier in the day. We actually travelled down to the pitch and had a look and it was frozen during the day. Anyway, they decided to play the game and bits of it were still like this. And um, we started the game uh, offloading um, and uh, you know, it, 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 we were throwing ball away and I, I, I sent a message on. I just said, look. Hold on to the ball. Put away, put away the that. offload for, for the next 10 minutes. No offloads for the next 10 minutes. I want them to have to work harder to get the ball back because I felt that we were always a bit fitter than, than the French teams. And as soon as we force them to make 10 phases of tackles, we got space anyway because they, they started, to, started to, to be a bit slower to get in the position. And so that, that's one that comes to, my, comes to mind. But I've, well, I've been on teams that we've had to call in the group and say, stop offloading the ball, we're turning it over, wet conditions and stuff. Yeah. But again, it's that uh, sometimes that perception, we call it, that Joe doesn't want fellas to offload and, you know. Yeah. I, I mean, it's probably you have a look at, I, I mean, there was a perception that's what, that's what I was coaching in Leinster because it was happening so often. It was happening because we were winning collisions and we had players who were very adept at doing it. Um, you know, I got asked after the Japan game where we made more offloads than than we normally would. Is is that a change and is that not working for us? And and the change hadn't been made at all. It was just that yeah. the um, circumstances. The the circumstances, and then we tried to chase the game a bit when we were seven points down, and and it, it's just the way it evolved because it, people think that you've got an influence on the game. Again, once the players get out there. You, you, you can send a message on, but really you, there's, a, there's a fair bit of distance between you and what's happening on the pitch. Yeah. Look, that was fascinating because I, I think that is definitely one of the topics that we don't get to tease out too often with the Ireland coach in this instance, the former Ireland coach. <laughs> former, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he may be again. <laughs> Retired or the, Irish coach. The book is called Ordinary Joe. It's by Joe Schmidt. It's available now and published by Penguin Ireland. He's going to be in conversation with Joe Malloy in Dublin, Limerick and Belfast. Tickets for the events are available at penguin.co.uk forward slash events. Uh, best of luck with it and enjoy the next couple of months anyway.